one of the things that changed, obviously lots and lots of things changed, and one of the very minor changes that, that took place as we've walked through these last few days is that, um, that the message that we had prepared for, that we had planned, that um, we thought you know, weeks ago was, was the direction that this week would go, um, that's for a different week. Uh, so we'll, we'll, at some point, that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, about those pieces. But as I have sat with these families, as I have walked with our staff, as we've walked as a church through all of these, uh, the circumstances of the last few days, it's just been very clear that, that God had a very different conversation for us this morning, that there's a, a passage of scripture that he has continued to bring into mind. It's shown up at, in bedside conversations with people who are grieving and healing. It's been part of just the, the, the journey through these last few days. And so this morning, we're just going to, we're gonna open God's word. We're going to listen to what he has for us in this story, but the reality is what we're gonna hear is that this is also is an invitation for us to, to get closer to him. And so we're gonna be in, in Matthew chapter 14. And this story, this story begins in, in the echoes, in so many ways, in the echoes of, of one of Jesus' most well-known miracles. It's in the echoes of, of the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples have, have been with Jesus. They've, they've seen these, these miracles that have happened. They've experienced this extraordinary moment as Jesus took a, a handful of, of bread and some fish and, and broke it and fed person after person after person. And it's at just the, about the same time as all of this is happening, this miracle is happening, that, that the disciples are, are really starting to get a glimpse into, into who Jesus actually is. They're beginning to feel confident in, in who he was. They're, they're beginning to understand what they should expect as they, as they walk with him, as they, as they journey with him and, and go from town to town and the crowds gather and the crowds respond and, and people are beginning to, to know who Jesus is and they're, they're getting this front row seat to, to all of Jesus' earthly ministry at this point. And then they experience the storm, right? And then they experience this moment that that causes them to question all the pieces of, of what they've experienced and cause them to forget what, what they have already learned. And as Matthew writes this story, as he's now years removed from, from the experience on, on the lake, he's putting pen to paper and he's, and he's writing the story of, of this moment in the disciples' life of, as they've journeyed with Jesus. And the transition between miracle and, and the storm is, is so abrupt. Right, and in just a few sentences, the disciples that go from, from cleaning up the, and celebrating this, this miracle that has happened right in front of their eyes, that they've gotten to be part of Jesus doing this thing that it's just utterly extraordinary. And a few sentences later, Jesus is, has, has sent them out onto the lake, has, has sent them out into this, this journey across the lake where there's a storm and all these things are happening and, and Jesus has, has gone up to the mountain to, to pray, to connect with the Father. And it's quite literally as Jesus dismisses the crowd and retreats to the mountains to pray, in just a few sentences we see extraordinary miracle. We see the, the cleanup, the work that the disciples are doing. We, we see the stats, right? That this is what's left over after all of the, the, the feeding of all of these people has happened. It's the boat. And then the disciples find themselves in the storm. And so this is a story of, of real people who are, who are wrestling with with big questions and wrestling with big moments in their lives. This is a story of, of some men in a boat as they're going across this lake and they're experiencing this storm and they're trying to make sense of who Jesus is, right? What it means to be his follower, right? All the same kinds of questions that, that maybe felt settled on, on one side of the storm, but now that the storm is happening, they're wrestling with questions like, how do we handle the storm when in this moment it feels like Jesus is just so far away? and they're wrestling. And so we look at this story and we say this, this story feels familiar, right? Not because we're aware of the, of the circumstances of, of the, the exact details of the story, but because we know what it feels like to be in the storm. We know what it feels like to, to feel like, like, like God is, is a long way away from us and we're experiencing a storm, this unexpected moment, and we're, we're shell-shocked and we're confused and we're trying to make sense of all of it. What do we do? What do we do when Jesus seems like he is far away and we are in the middle of a storm? Matthew 14, immediately, right? This is just the aftermath, the direct aftermath of, of the feeding of the 5,000. It says this, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. 
And after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. And so this story starts with, with the miracle, right? It starts in the, in the echoes of, of the miracle, but, but there's two settings that, that are particularly important. We have the story that, that starts with, with Jesus on the mountain, right? That he has retreated, he's on, in the mountain, and he's gathered with his father in the, in the middle of the mission, right? Well, well, all these kinds of things are happening around him, and miracles, and, and storms, and, and all the things that are part of his earthly ministry. Jesus pauses, goes into the mountain to reconnect and make sure he stays connected with the father. So Jesus is on the mountain, and the disciples, the disciples are in the boat, and the recording that we have of this story, as Matthew puts pen to paper and, and, and tells the story of, of what occurred as the disciples navigated the, the situation that they found themselves in, it's written from the perspective of the disciples. And so it becomes an experience and a memory that's, that's shaped by their perception of distance, right? It's shaped by, by the choices that they make throughout the process and, and the circumstances that they find themselves in. So it says this, later that night, Later that night, he was there alone, right? Jesus was in the, on the mountain alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Before this story was a Bible story, before this story was, was recorded and became part of our scripture, became a sacred part of, of our experiences as followers of Jesus, this story was was a memory and a conversation that the disciples would have had over and over and over again around campfires on the beach, around dinner tables as they, as they told the stories of, of the kinds of things they experienced as they, as they followed after Jesus in the, in the years that would have followed between the experience that they had on the lake and when Matthew wrote his letter to the church to, to encourage the church that was that was being persecuted, that was experiencing hardship, that was going through its own storm. As Matthew records the story of of Jesus' ministry, that the echoes of the sense of distance because it's written by men who remember. Even with years of clarifying experiences, as the disciples continued to walk with Jesus through other experiences, saw other miracles, were, were formed in ways along the way in conversations that would build their faith, that, that when they told this story, even years later, as it's, as it's finally being written down and, and recorded in writing for, for it to be preserved across generations, that there is still a sense of distance. You can still feel the distance that they felt between them and Jesus as they navigated the storm. Because what we see in this story and the way that Matthew records these sentences is, is that what they seem to know and what they seem to be, to be able to really get their hands and, and heads around is that, is that Jesus has gone up the mountain and he has sent them across the lake. Jesus and them. And so this shows up in the language that they use. They use words and phrases like, Jesus was on the mountain alone. And we were a considerable distance across the lake, right? There is, there is considerable distance that that the, the wind and the waves were, were against them, right? And the language that they're using shows the isolation that they felt, shows the, the despair that they felt and the distance that they felt. And Matthew, as he's recording this, may not have even realized the, the tone of what he was writing, but, but the struggle is clear. And so it would be easy for the disciples to see this, this story as, as really three stories, as, as a bigger story that has these three stories in it. We have, we have the miracle, right, which is, gives context for all of this. We have the mountain and we have the storm. The miracle is where they perceived that, that God was so close to them, right? That, that they saw Jesus do a miracle that, that only a God could do, right? That, that he, he separates the, the bread and he, and he breaks apart the fish and begins to feed and feed and feed and he does this extraordinary thing and the disciples are, are watching as, as Jesus does something that makes them feel so close to God that they realize who he is and what he's capable of. They, they see his presence and they see his power in the world around them. The miracle is where they perceive that God was close. And then the mountain then is, is where God is, right, in the context of this story. And they're surrounded as they operate within the culture that they would have operated in 2,000 years ago. There are so many ancient cultures who would have looked to the mountains and said, the mountains are where the gods live. Right, that they really only come down to, to where real life happens, where humanity is, to, to meddle or to punish or to just to like involve themselves for a time in the, in the, uh, the affairs of men and then they, and they go back up the mountain and, and mankind goes about its daily lives. 
Obviously, the disciples knew that those, mytho- those myths are, are not their story, but that's the culture that they were swimming in. And then the storm. The storm is where real life is happening, and you can feel the distance, right? You can feel the distance between where they are and, and, and where they perceive Jesus to be in this moment, that this distance that brings a sense of disconnection, this, this sense that maybe God doesn't care. And so as they experience the storm, as they experience the wind and the waves and the struggle to get across the lake, that, that it's all amplified because it, there's a sense of distance and it makes it harder to handle. Because the disciples have, have been through things with Jesus. Right? They have just recently heard the news of, of John the Baptist's brutal death. They've, they've been called followers of, of Satan by religious leaders at the time. They've, they've seen Jesus do miracles. They've just recently been in a boat in a storm and, and Jesus has stood and spoken, peace, be still to the storm. They have seen Jesus do things and they have been with him. But now in this moment, as they go across in the, in the midst of this storm, there's this sense that, that what they're doing now, it feels like they're doing it without him. And so they know, of course, they know that, that God doesn't live in the mountains. They know that, that Jesus is on their side. They know that, that Jesus fundamentally is, is with them. His very presence on earth is, is, is a sign that, that God is with them. But in this moment, but in this moment, what they knew and what they felt weren't the same. So shortly before dawn, verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Shortly before dawn, as Matthew records this story, the the moments before dawn, as we are are well aware, those of us who have spent nights awake, that the night is at its darkest before the dawn starts to break, right? That the the, the night and the the length of time that we've experienced darkness, it's, it's when the night has felt long, just before the dawn begins to break. And so this is the context in which this moment in the story happens. And so here, has, here is Jesus, who has done miracles before, who's now stepping into this story in a new way, making his identity abundantly clear. As he's coming, he's revealing himself not as one who can, who can pull off some magic tricks, not as, as someone who's just a good teacher or, or someone who functions as a prophet speaking on behalf of God, but, but he is God. He's the one who can walk on water. And so with every step across the water, every step that he comes closer to the boat, he's, he's declaring his true identity. And, and the disciples, as they're watching this happen, they're trying to make sense of what they're experiencing because in their minds, you can, you can feel the sense that that Jesus is somewhere else. And they're in the storm. And so what they're seeing, they can't reconcile what they're seeing with, with, with what they know and what they believe. And so the disciples are terrified. And in their fear and blinded by their, their fear, they start to make up their own story about what they're experiencing. They, they try to make a, a story that, that they can get their heads around, that can make sense of, of what they're seeing. And so they, they look and they say this, this has to just be a ghost. This has to be something that, that we can at least get our heads around. And then, and then the ghost speaks. But Jesus, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Jesus speaks when he's within earshot of, of the disciples as they're in their, the storm and the wind and the waves and all these things. They, they hear the voice of Jesus speaking to them across all of those circumstances, across the swirl that's, that's happening around them. But Jesus says something very unexpected. He says a thing that is not what they expected to hear. The last time that they were in a boat and, the, and there was a storm and, and Jesus was with them, that, that Jesus stood and he said, he said, peace, be still. And, and the wind and the waves calmed and yet in this moment not only are they not sure what to make sense of how to make sense of what they're seeing what they're hearing doesn't feel like what Jesus has done before because Jesus instead of saying peace be still and immediately changing their circumstances he says take courage it is I don't be afraid it's not peace be still but it's a call to courage a call to trust him in the midst of the storm And so Peter speaks, right? Peter, often the first to speak, says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. So Jesus replies, come. So then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Jesus. 
And this is a moment that for many of us, as we look at this story, as we maybe like remove ourselves from the familiarity of, of, of the story for some of us, that, that we look and we say, what was Peter thinking? <laughs> right? They're terrified. The, the, what's happening is unexpected. What's happening is, is, is difficult for them to reconcile with what their experience with Jesus has been, up to, been like up to this point. And, and instead of Peter saying, guys, I think we need to row as fast as we can in, in the opposite direction, Peter speaks. He engages in conversation with, with this ghost, this one they're not even sure yet who the, what the identity really is, who's, who he's asking to prove himself. And so he, he engages in conversation with, with what they're seeing. And what he says is, is so interesting because he, he asks Jesus to prove himself by asking Jesus to invite him to come closer. Right, which is an incredible risk, right? It's an incredible risk because if, if it is just a ghost, if it isn't who, who he's claiming to be, that, that Peter is putting himself in extraordinary danger, right? If he's, if he's saying, if it's, if it's really you, then, then ask me to put myself in, in peril, right? Ask me to step out of the boat and into the storm and into the water where, as a fisherman, Peter would have been very, very familiar with what, with what happens when a fisherman leaves his boat in the middle of a storm. But Peter... But Peter says, Lord, if it's you, right? Lord, if it's you, do what you have done from, from day one in relationship with you. Would you call me closer? Would you invite me to come closer to you? Maybe Peter, I mean, we don't know Peter's thoughts in this moment, but perhaps Peter is still thinking about the miracle that he's just experienced with Jesus. Maybe he's, he's, he's thinking about the moment where he watched and got to participate with Jesus as he fed 5,000 people with, with what was an impossibly, an impossibly small amount of food. And he's like, I just, if there is a miracle to get in on, then yeah, I'm willing to put myself at risk because I, I want to get in on this that he wants to experience this partnership with him. Or, or maybe Peter is, is just being impulsive. Maybe he's seeing this, this experience that, that he's never experienced before and says, I, I wanna know what that's like, that, that if there's any possibility that I could step out of this boat and, and walk across the waves, then, then I would love to get in on that. Or maybe, or maybe, maybe Peter just needed to see that his relationship with Jesus was still intact. Maybe he just needed to get closer. And so we don't know, right? We don't know the motivation that, that Peter had in this moment, but, but what we do know is there is this incredible moment where this fisherman, the one who understood the dangers of leaving the boat in the middle of the storm, takes a breath, puts his legs over the boat, steps out onto the waves, and finds footing, right? And begins to step and he begins to walk, and he begins to, to approach Jesus on the water. But whatever thrill that, that Peter may have felt by defying the laws of physics and the natural world as he understood it, quickly gave way to something different, quickly gave way to fear in the midst of the storm, because it says this in Matthew fourteen thirty. but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me, and immediately, and immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And so Peter wasn't scared of what we might think that Peter would have been scared of, right? That, that Peter wasn't scared of the fact that he's standing on the lake, right? That would have been an unsettling experience for him that, that all of a sudden now the, the very rules that, that he had operated within the physical world has, has now been bent in a way that is irreconcilable with, with what he understands about, about the way the world works. He wasn't scared even about what this miracle could mean, right? What, what does it mean that if Jesus can call me in the midst of a storm to, to step out and to be able to walk on water, then, then if this is preparation for whatever might come next, what could he be calling me to next that's, that's gonna be even more extraordinary, that might require even more of me than, than, than what this moment has required of me? If this is possible, if this is possible, what might Jesus ask of me next? But Peter doesn't seem to be scared of any of those things. Peter seems to be scared, and Peter is scared of the storm, right? The circumstances in which this miracle is happening, something that, that is a fisherman who has spent many, many years on, on a boat, who has experienced many, many storms, is, is scared of the storm, right? He has survived every storm that he has encountered in a boat from, from, from the, the entirety of his life. And yet that becomes a thing that he's afraid of. 
His focus isn't on the adventure that Jesus is inviting him into. His, his focus is on the circumstances and the challenges in which the adventure is taking place. And so what I see, I think, in this moment might be for, for many of us, and I'm not alone in this, this might be one of the most discouraging moments within this whole story because, because Peter doesn't seem to get credit for trying. He doesn't seem to be graded on the curve. Like, he gets back in the boat and he could say something like, well, guys, at least I tried, right? Jesus doesn't, doesn't, like, attempting to walk on water, attempting to come toward you, doesn't that get me some sort of, like, participation trophy or some kind of, like, reassurance that, well, at least I tried, but what we see is, like, what, is not what many of us would do, where we might try to excuse our own missteps by saying, well, at least I tried, or, hey, I took more steps than everybody else managed to take coming out of the boat, and we like, compare ourselves to, to those around us. Because this passage strips any kind of comparison, strips any kind of desire for, for being graded on the curve away, because as Jesus is concerned, there's there's the faith of the disciples, including Peter, and there's, there's not a distinction that's being made in the midst of all of these things. That every single one who's participating in this story was, was being invited to grow in faith, to grow in a deeper version of faith that would carry them through the difficult things that would, that would mark their journey with and being sent by Jesus. And the good news, the good news is that when Peter's faith was little, right, when Peter's faith was little and even when it was sprinkled with doubt, that it was enough because, because Jesus is enough. That when he cried out that Jesus took hold of him and, and pulled him out of the water, that, that our faith, our faith, what Peter is learning in this moment is our faith isn't proven by our willingness to walk on water. Our faith is proven by, by trusting in the midst of the storm. And so Peter is experiencing something that has played out in the bigger story. You, we look at these moments where we have the, have the miracle, the, the, big, the bigger story, the, the miracle of the, that Jesus is, is working with the feeding of the 5,000. And we've got, we've got Jesus, or Peter with the, the moment that, that feels like the mountain, the distance between him and Jesus. And then, we, and then we have the storm, right? Peter experiencing the, the three elements that are part of the bigger story, now made personal and becoming a personal experience for him of this story. And just like in the bigger story, Peter is learning to see all of it differently, learning to see that, that Jesus is with him, that, that it's not that Jesus is just with us in the miracles when we have these tangible moments where we, where we see Jesus at work and we see God at work in the world around us and we feel close to him, but, but Jesus is with him in the midst of this storm. And then Jesus asks the big question, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And the disciples have heard this before. This is the same thing that Jesus said when he calmed the water in their first storm experience. He says, so, so you have little faith, why did you doubt? But, but just like we are, they're forgetful people. They need to be reminded. But if there's little faith, if there's little faith, then there must also be bigger faith. Right, and this becomes then a question that, that invites them to lean in, that invites them to, to take hold of something that, that could change their lives as they move forward, to, to look at this moment like so many other conversations with Jesus where, where Jesus says, so, so this is where we start, and from here we begin to build this bigger faith. From here we, we invite you, I invite you to, to keep getting closer. And so we see this invitation and the question to, to a bigger faith and to to confidence in Jesus regardless of the circumstances. And when they climbed into the boat, when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, truly you are the son of God. And so the other disciples began to own the, the things that they have felt, began to own the, the things that they've experienced, and they began to fully embrace the identity of Jesus, the, the this is this is I, right? I am, I am walking to you on the water. The, the it is I statement that Jesus made coming across the water now, now fully embraced by the disciples as they, as they step into this moment. Jesus giving them eyes to see that God wasn't closer to them at, at any other point of the story than he is in this specific moment. That, that the, the idea that, that, that Jesus and, and, and God are on the mountain, that, that God is active in the miracles and, and leaves us to figure out the storms by themselves, that all fades away and they just simply worship Jesus for who he is. That, that God, this is not a story of God having moved closer to them. This is a story of, of them getting closer and closer and closer to the heart of God. And so there's the bigger story, 
There's the bigger story and the mountain and the miracle and, and the storm. And then there's Peter's experience of, of a version of this miracle with his own version of what that mountain feels like and, and the miracle and, and the storm. And then now 2,000 years later, 2,000 years later, here we are and, and we have our stories. But we are part, but we are part of a big story. We are part of a big story in a way that the disciples, as they experienced what they've experienced, as they, as they walked with Jesus and saw the fullness of, of what his earthly ministry looked like, could not imagine the big story that we're invited into. So if we take one step back and we look at this through, through the lens of, of a much, much bigger story that, that we look and we have this miracle, Jesus with us, right, for a time, 2,000 years ago, taking on flesh, dwelling among us, working miraculously, living and dying and raising himself from the dead for us, leading the way through death for us, this, this miraculous moment in, 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 within human history. And then he goes to be with the Father. Well, he sends the church out. And as the church goes and experiences the turmoil and the turbulence and the, and the difficulties and moving toward hope but, but getting at it slow because of the wind and the waves that, that over time there begins to feel like there's a distance between, between where we are and where God is. That we get so comfortable with the story that, that Jesus is, is up there, that Jesus is with the Father, that he's distant, that, that when it comes to these kinds of moments as we, as we move forward as, as the church that that when Jesus begins to move and we begin to perceive him and see him come closer and closer and closer that, that we have to try and figure out how to make stories that, that can try and make sense of, of what we're experiencing. And so, so there's the big story. And then there's our story within the big story. And we have these moments, right? We have these moments where there are these good times. We have these moments that feel like miracles, that, that feel like we're, we're lighthearted and, and God is with us and we're experiencing the, the, his goodness and his grace in our lives. And then and it feels like we're, we're in these other moments where we're in the storm. And we start to, to step into that same story that says, so, so God's up there. He's so far. And here I am in, in the boat and here I am struggling in the storm and, and all these kinds of things. And and it's when Jesus starts to move close and we start to see him stepping into the storm and stepping into the moments that we find ourselves in that, that because we've got this story of, of God is far and we're, we're doing this real life thing and he's, he's, he's not involving himself in the storms of our lives that, that we start to miss the big story playing out in our story. And so it's in this, it's in this that we hear the, the words of Jesus spoken across the wind and the waves. He says, so take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. He says, come, right, come closer to me. And he asks the question, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In all of these moments, these words that Jesus speaks as we, as we insert ourselves and we understand our story within the context of, of the big story and the, and the, and the bigger story and, and the stories of those who have gone before us that, that we realize that in, that in all of this, that in all of this, this is an invitation to to a bigger faith and to a confidence in Jesus that, that takes us through all sorts of circumstances. To trust him in the storm. To step out on the water even when the wind and the waves are swirling, even when we're not sure the, to, how to make sense of, of what we're seeing and who it is that's, that's speaking to us and calling us to obedience. And to get closer to him in the process. Because big faith because big faith and confidence in Jesus happens in the storm and it's not a matter of stepping out of the boat or, or walking on water. It's keeping our eyes on him, of following when he says come, of, of trusting his presence and trusting his invitation to us. Leaning on the good news that, that even little faith, even with some doubt sprinkled in as we try and make sense of the storms, that it's enough because Jesus is enough. And so if you're in the storm, as so many of us are, if you're in the storm, this is, this is an invitation to, to fix your eyes on Jesus, to trust him in the midst of the storm. If, if you're not in the midst of a storm, if you're coming out of a storm, or if you just experience those kinds of things, this is an invitation to, to hear the question, what rose up in me that, that caused me to doubt? 
to allow Jesus to do what he did with the disciples, to, to look back at these experiences and say, so, so how do I grow a bigger faith? How do we get closer to him in all of this? To quiet ourselves before God and to let him speak, to let him reveal himself as present with us in all circumstances. Because he is with us. He is close. And he is inviting us to get closer to his heart, to a, to a big faith and a confidence, to confidence in him.